into the goal square. Williams steps up, goal! Greg Williams has been magnificent again. What a good mark, but look at Williams. Williams, again on his own. Welcome, Diesel. Mike, thanks for having me. Pleasure. And you mightn't have always believed this, but you've been one of my all-time favourites. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us and to sort of take you back through memory lane. Yeah, no, it'd be good to, to do that and see what we can come up with. How can a bloke of 175 centimetres who can't run and can't jump be so good? Yeah, well, that was a big problem early days, Mick. Um, the recruiters thought that, and, um, and Carlton did as well, obviously. They gave me the arse a couple of times. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, I just had to fight back from there. So 1983, you went to the Carlton, was that the first time? I actually played, when I was 17, I played a seconds game for Carlton. And um, yeah, I kicked four points that day on the half forward flank and had 25 possessions. I actually remember it. I don't remember a lot well, but I remember that well. And I just think if I had to kick four goals, then maybe I would have stayed there, you know? So what was the verdict? Did they come to you and say that they didn't think you were up to it? No, not so much. They were happy with what well, I did that day. I was only a young bloke, but... I went back to Bendigo and um, did pre-season with the Carlton group up there and that's where it started with Carlton. Now let's uh, fast track to the end of it. We'll review the career. 250 games, yep. two Brownlows, two Best and Ferris, a Norm Smith medal and six All-Australian jumpers. I mean, it, yep. it's staggering return, isn't it, for someone who sort of took a while to get into the system? Yeah, it was. No, exactly. And, um, you know, that's the great thing, I think, about my story, really. But, um, you know, I didn't give up. I um, fought hard and trained hard and, you know, I ended up writing a letter to Tom Hafey um, at the 83 pre-season and, yeah, he said come down and train, which, you know, gave me the opportunity to train with him and, yeah, I was lucky enough to get really fit and um, I got, obviously, first game for Geelong in 84. So when, when Carlton said no, you went back to Golden Square and played. And was, it, was your self-belief as strong as it had been before that? Or, or oh, look, I had doubts. Don't, don't worry. And that's where, you know, the old man really was the biggest supporter and mum, of course. But, you know, Dad said you're as good as him all the time. You know, he always, you know, was such a huge rap for me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I had so much uh, confidence in my ability. And, you know, I went home crying a couple of times from Carlton. Don't Did worry. You? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I was very upset. And, but even saying that, Carlton... You know, they had their mosquito fleet in those days and playing in premierships, they weren't really looking for a, a small slow bloke, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think? Did you, did you actually think that the chance had gone or you obviously were renewed when you decided to sit down and pen a letter to Tommy Hafey? Who put you up to that? Yeah, well, I was playing with Golden Square and Tony Southgate was coach. He played with Carlton, yep. was a you know, great player. Ron Barassi, uh, sorry, Ron Barassi, Ron Best was playing as well. Bestie who... You know, he's a good friend of mine as well, and he helped me write the letter to Geelong, and he was a bit the same, keep going, have another go, you know, so that's what I did. So why did you pick Geelong? Um, good question. I think, yeah, we just hoped that Tommy had, had liked the idea, and, yeah, he was straight straight back to us and said, come down to pre-season. So. What did you say? Did you win your suit? Was it a plea to Tommy, or did you... How did you catch the... Uh Oh, look, it was just an ask. We weren't, didn't want any promises or anything. We just asked to, to do pre-season, you mm -hmm. know, and a lot of, there was a lot of country kids who tried that, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, most senior clubs would have four or five or so country kids who come down and do pre-season. Let's stay with Golden Square for a minute. You played with your brother, John. He, yep. used, to, he used to ride shotgun for you. That's right, yes. He's yep. pretty rugged, wasn't he? Yeah, no, John, obviously 15 months older than me. Bigger man than me. He was 6'2", and... I think there's a lot of trainers say the biggest legs they've ever rubbed, you know. That's how, he's a real big man. And, um, no, he was tough. Uh, John was the toughest person I've ever played with or or seen, really. There's no doubt about it. So he gave you, would have had a fair bit of confidence, oh, wouldn't you, knowing that your brother was sort of in the vicinity? I, I did. I had a dream run through school. Um, I went to Kangaroo Flat Tech, and uh, John was the best fire in the school when I got there. So John's in form two, and he's the best fire at the school. And, <laughs> I went 4-1, so I had a dream run. <laughs> what about you? your father was uh, a, a Bendigo identity, Lee? Um, yeah. He was pretty keen dishing out some advice to you, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. No, Dad was an expert on football and sport. He's a good sportsman in his own right. You know, he's a fantastic squash player, played for Victoria. And, yeah, like he had every game, he'd, I'd talk to him after every game and, um, 
he'd always tell me if I was hanging out and not going in hard enough. Or Did that ever occur? I mean, was there a oh, situation? Yeah. yeah, all the time. All the time? Oh, well, if he wasn't happy with the way I was going, he'd, mm. he'd certainly tell me. And, and it was pretty simple, you know, the game and the way I played it. And, you know, when I did have a bad game, it was it pretty much summed it up, saying that you're not going in hard enough. And, and that's what pretty much was the, the difference between a good game and a bad game. Any golden pieces of advice from him? Oh, look, there's a lot of advice. Oh, well, even early days, you know, when I, I was getting a lot of attention, you know, from taggers and opposition, of course, you know, from, from every angle, you know, everyone trying to stop me getting the ball, really. And, um, you know, I put up with a lot, and no, Dad always said that make sure that you don't let them keep getting away with too much or they'll keep doing it. So, you know, I didn't let blokes hang on and that sort of stuff, of course, as much. So did you whack him then? Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, I sent that message early days and and I think it stood me in pretty good stead. There was obviously a couple of games and probably more than a couple <laughs> where I got into a bit of trouble. But um, no, I think most people knew that if, if they did hang on or do things against the rules, well, I wouldn't put up with it, you know. Your first game at Geelong, you're playing Fitzroy. Fitzroy has come off a final series. Yep. The Geelong centre line in that first game in 1984... Red. Michael Turner on a wing. That's right. This slow bloke from Bendigo in the middle called Greg Williams. Yep. Chap called G. Ablett on the other side. Yep. Fitzroy boys were in for a surprise, weren't they? <laughs> no, they really were. I think Jacko was full forward. That's right. Yeah. And um, no, that was, I often say that's the best day of my life that day. Um, it was that hard to get there. Uh, like it took me years to get there. And, you know, I was really fit. Tommy, you know, trained me like no one else. And I was really fit that, and I was ready. I'd had three years of training to get to that game and you know, I really made the most of it when I got there. Yeah. Do you remember your numbers that day? My possessions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What'd you have? <laughs> 38 possessions I had. 38, did you? <laughs> you think? <laughs> no, I know I did. <laughs> no, I remember it well. I was selected to play in the centre that day, first round of the year. And I just recall having lunch with my father on the Friday and he asked me who I was playing on. And at that point I said to him, I think, I recall saying to him, I'm not quite sure, but it's some guy that wasn't good enough and that Carlton didn't take on a couple of years in a row. And so, of course, we went down to Cadinia Park thinking that we were going to blow the cats away and, and uh, history suggests that that didn't happen. And uh, I think Williams, I played, on, I played on Diesel and Diesel had 30 plus, maybe 35 plus, kicked a goal and and uh, then of course he got three votes in the Brownlow medal and uh, in his first game and, and unfortunately I was the uh, it was a big career limiting limiting for me at that point but uh, I was uh, I was the player that played on him and and uh, on the Sunday my father rang me and said after he read the papers and he said do you know who that player is now? What about the handball? You came into league football handballing like we grew to acknowledge and, and sort of have so much respect for later on in your mm. career. What made you so keen on using handball as a weapon? Speed was obviously an issue and, you know, my strength obviously was getting the ball. And, um, yeah, handball was just part of my game on the juniors and all the way through and obviously it didn't change. You know, I relied on my teammates so much as well, like, or more than most players, you know. But I helped them, of course, as well. And um, they helped me and, you know, a lot of them, I remember even the first practice game I played for Geelong where um, Mick Turner was captain, and I told Mick first. I reckon it was the first boundary throwing. Mick, just stand over there. You know, <laughs> I want you to stand there. So I'm telling the captain what to do in the first game, and um, I got it, of course, Mick. And uh, handball, and he wasn't there. And I blew up at him and said, "Just stand there." I really liked, always liked to know what I was going to do with it before I got it. You know, and it was always handy to have. You know, you knew a bloke was going to be there or there. You know, I always had a couple of blokes set up to to make sure they're there when I got it. So. But is, you admitted it yourself, that's pretty cheeky, isn't it, for a bloke who finally gets his chance at an Very AFL cheeky. club, he's playing his first game, and he's telling the captain where to stand? No, it is a bit cheeky. But Mick stand there every time since. <laughs> Don't worry, he loved it. And, um, and he was really good at it. He just got in a good position all the time. The pace you talked about before, about not being over-endowed with it, yeah. you wore calipers as a kid. Was there a relation between that, a relationship between... Oh, look, I'm not sure about that. I'm really not. All our kids are slow. So mm. I don't think it was the calipers. John was slow. My bigger brother's six four. Uh, sorry, my smaller brother's younger brother's six four, and he's um, he's nearly the slowest person I've ever seen. And so what was, were your calipers for? Well, my legs were crooked. 
Mm. Yeah, going outwards, and they just that's what they did in those days. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm. okay. Not long at Geelong. We'll talk about the reasons for that shortly. But yep. um, in your second year, 1985, you played in the infamous Geelong Hawthorne game at Princess Park. I did. The yeah. day made famous by the uh, Lee Matthews Neville Bruns incident. Mm. What are your memories of that? Oh, it was a pretty electric day that day. It was a um, bad finish, very bad finish. But yeah, it was a tough game. I remember Jacko was being Jacko, and I think I ran through Michael Tuck himself early in the game. You think you did? You know no, you did. No, did. You heard him, didn't you? Yeah, I shared front of him, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, it just grew from there early. And then obviously the Bruns incident, and yeah, I even looked like the whole crowd was going to get involved that day. Mm. It was really uh, a sad day, really. Have you ever been on a football field with? With an atmosphere like that was that day? No, it was very really, was dangerous sort of a atmosphere at the end. It was really like the crowd was going to come to the ground, mm, you know. Mm. But but sometimes and unfortunately that thing those sorts of things happen. You damaged your knee in your first year at Geelong? I did, yep. Won the best and fairest in your second year, and then you're off to Sydney. Yep, that's right. Well, that seems incomprehensible these mm. days. Apparently it was over five grand, is that right? Yeah, at the end that's a true story about the you know, I, I wanted half of what Sydney offered me. So what did Sydney offer you? Well, it was 100000 There's a few benefits as well and mm-hmm. uh, incentives and stuff like that, but it was a lot of money back then. It really was. And I said to Geelong, pay half and I'll stay, and they offered me 45 and that was it. Up 45 up from what? Do you remember? Oh, that was pretty it. Well, it, 45. You know, yeah, I but don't think been, what, what, what were you playing on initially at Geelong? Oh, I was about 30 or so. Yeah. 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 Which I was on a pretty good wicket first year or so Yeah, yeah for, a, for a new bloke. Yeah, so they went to 45. Yeah. And then who blocked it? Do you know? I think I know. You think you know? I do know. Or is it I think it was Billy Bill. Goggin? Yeah, I think it was Bill. Hmm. Yep. For any good reason? I mean, we... no, I'm not sure. I... But I think there was like the Sleepy Hollow sort of thing where they thought, you know, Greg won't go. Like, he loves Ocean Grove and mm. loves Geelong and and he, he mucked it up. You could have played at Geelong. They played in four grand finals during your playing career. You could have spent mm. your entire career with Gary Ablett Senior. Yeah. Any regrets? Yeah, like it would be great to have stayed there and played, and who knows what would have happened. I'm, I'm not sure what, but um, you know, I decided to go. I'm a professional. I was a professional footballer. I had that, you know, that was my chance to to make money as well, and I I took the chance and I went to Sydney, and that was the decision I made. Now you went to Sydney with several big names. Who targeted you? I mean, Jeffrey Edelson was the man that was seen to be trying to mm. amass these big names and create a football team there. But who yeah. who was doing the recruiting? Yeah. I think I know who it was. Um, Tom Hovey was the main. Okay. Tom's coach. So Tommy had coached you at Geelong. Yeah, of course. Knew he how well you played. Year. Yeah. He went, we, all, we all went at the same time. Okay. So Tommy okay. was the yeah. the one who said get in. After the break, Diesel talks about the taggers he loved to whack. And the day he was deregistered and fined $25,000 by the AFL for contract irregularity. Into the goal square, Williams, step shot, goal! Williams straightens up and goes towards goal. Long to the mark, but look at Williams. Williams, again on his own. I remember you saying I was at a function once when you were talking about the way you planned your career. I mean, your preparation was faultless, and when you ran out on the ground every week, you had a target, did you not? Yeah, I did. Yeah, no, I had a game plan, definitely. Which was? It was to get 40 positions every game. Mm. That was my, it was pretty basic, but. <laughs> and broke them down to 10 a quarter? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, 10, yeah, that's all I did. I just, possessions, possessions, possessions. Mm. That was the, my focus, and you know, I trained to do that. And yeah, I'd go in at half time every game. And um, it got to the stage where the bloke could tell me what I've had at mm. half-time. I always wanted to know what I had at half-time. Yeah. I never counted my stats like some blokes did because I was concentrating on other things. But, um, yeah, no, I did. I 10 every quarter. If I was 15 at half-time, you know, I had to get 25 in the second half to get 40. And that mm-hmm. was my focus and that's what I focused on and it worked for me. You top 50 once, is that right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, for the Swans, I, yeah, I got up to 53 or so. So... 53 great. or so. Yeah. Amazing number of people. Who was that against? That was the St Kilda at the, my favourite ground, the SCG. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I kicked six as well, Mike. Now, you went to war with several players over your career, and you're lots of them, actually. A couple of famous ones, a couple of names that spring to mind, Sean yeah. Denham and Tony Shaw. Yeah, that's right. Um, you didn't like Taggers, did you? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I didn't like people trying to stop me doing what I did. 
but that was their job, but I just didn't like it, and I um, made it as hard for them as they made it hard for me. You were happy to administer your own form of justice? I mean, if uh, they hung on, they cop one, is that right? Yeah, they did, and also, you know, I got whacked a few times as well, you know, so if I got hit, I was most often retaliated, maybe not straight away, but maybe a year later or two years later. Wasn't that one of your dad's pieces of advice? Always get square? Yeah, it was. Yep. Tell me about Shuri. Carlton and Collingwood were always massive games, obviously, because they're mm. such powerful clubs. He went to you most times. I'm, I'm suspecting he probably played on you ten or a dozen times, did he? Yeah, maybe not that many, but he, yeah, he was a similar sort of a player. You know, same size and about the same pace as me. <laughs> <laughs> we're a good matchup. So, yeah, no, sure. He, you know, I really respected that guy and he, we played on each other a lot. You respected him <laughs> not enough to stop smacking him right in the nose one day. Yeah, no, I did. I, I split his nose really badly one day, but that was a bit of a retaliation from when he, he got reported for probably, a, it was probably a year or two before that. And like I said, I, I had a long memory. <laughs> and his nose presented itself and I hit it, you know. <laughs> you know, I didn't even go out there trying to do it or meaning to do it. It just, it just happened like that, you know. So, I'm sorry, Shorey. <laughs> so, sometimes there are blokes who play on each other regularly yeah. and they almost call an unofficial truce. Yep. Did that happen with you and Shorey? Actually, yeah, it did. No, it did. It was, I think it was a week after, oh, the year after I, um, you know, broke his nose badly. So, mm-hmm. and sure, he came up to me before the game and said, "Look, <laughs> no fighting today. Let's <laughs> let's just play footy." And and uh, actually, it was a good thing that he did. Actually, it needed to be done, and it was good that he said it because I would never have said it. Oh. And um, you know, we just played from then on, and you know, we had some good duels. Oh, look, Greg Williams is probably uh, the greatest player that I've ever played against. Um, yeah, not super quick. Uh, didn't have a big jump, probably like myself, but. His peripheral vision, uh, his foot and hand skills were as good as I've ever seen, uh, and his knowledge of how to play the game. Um, he was also tough, uh, you know, um, wouldn't give any quarter and gave a few out, don't worry about that. But uh, yeah, look, I, I just look on it as one of the greatest challenges I've had. I had a fairly good record on him at times, so uh, I'm pretty proud about that. But yeah, um, as I said, probably the greatest player I've played against. I saw you, uh, I think I saw it one day at the MCG, Sean Denham, who I really reckon got under your skin. Mm. And you smacked him in a final, probably about 50 or 80 metres off the ball. Is that a fair account of what happened? Yeah, that was in the grand final. In the grand final. Yeah, 93 yep. grand final. And, um, yeah, no, I remember that. And that, you know, that wasn't ideal by what I did either, really. You, know, you didn't like him, did you? No, I didn't. But he got five weeks, hit me before, the same day. Mm. And the first quarter, he bowled me on a bounty throw. And, you know, he tried to, you know, belt me, belt me well. Mm. So... <laughs> Like I said, I didn't, I can't remember planning it, but anyway, I just, he was right next to me and I belted him back and um, there he went off. I broke his nose. So, but he had the last laugh. He, unfortunately, the bombers beat us. Yeah. Did you, did you ever warn these blokes that, or I suppose they knew, Denham and Sean knew what was in store, didn't they? Yeah, look, Denham was a little bloke like me and, you know, he's a determined little bloke and, you know, he did a good job a few times and, you know, I reckon I beat him a few times, so. When you've had that sort of history, yeah. can you be friendly? I mean, post your football career, can you actually have a friendship with blokes like that? Oh, I think you can. I'm not best friends with Shorey or Denham, mm. but I'm, you know, I've seen Shorey and look, I've got a problem talking to Shorey. I, I don't hold any grudges, Re. Really. Sometimes the, they, those players do, but I really don't. I've seen Denham before and said hello. And, like, I really don't hold grudges what happened on the ground. Which, which opponent, which regular opponent gave you the most grief? Oh, like there was a lot of, like Shane Hurd from Essendon was tough, you know, Lamb from West Coast, yep. that big, he's a big strong man, you know, a bit bigger than me and strong, like they're hard to, to get around, you know, they really are. Did Hawthorne put Buckenara in the middle? When, yeah, he did. When they played yeah. the Swans to yeah, exploit, one day, exploit yeah. you in the air? Did that work? Oh, I think, oh, it worked alright, yeah, he, he played really well. Yeah. We played terrible. I played terrible, yeah, so it worked, but... Um, yeah, the whole team struggled that day, but no, they did it. Buckingham killed him out of the middle. He did. He was a serious player. You didn't actually care much about your opponents, though, did you? I mean, I'm talking. I'm not talking about the blokes who hung on to you, but mm. if you were pitted against someone, you did your thing and they did theirs. You backed yourself against them, correct? I did. No, I really did. I just had the pretty simple game plan: just get to all stoppages and you know try and wear out the bloke I'm on, which um, 
you know, if they ran into a forward line to think they're going to get it, I'd run out the other side and make them chase me and try and get a, get away from them, you know, so. So you didn't go quickly, no, but you went at a, at a solid pace for two hours, right? That's right. Now, look, like I said, if, if I'm going, to, he's, him and I are running the forward line, and he keeps going the forward line, and I run out to the half-back flank mm. or something, and I just think that our back line's going to get it, which yep. had happened a lot, and Silvani or Sexton or those guys would kick to me, I'd be free. And, um, you know, guys like Shorey or whoever had to make up that 100 metres to catch me all the time, and, you know, that happened 20, 30 times a game. Well, they, mm. gotta, they get tired. Well, I'm still running half pace, you know. <laughs> you play with lots of big names at, at the clubs you're at. Mm. Probably the biggest of all, Gary Ablett Senior. Yeah. You had two years with him. I did. Where does he sit amongst the blokes uh, in terms of pure talent? Oh, Gary's the best player I've ever played with. I always say that. I just I was in awe of his ability, and uh, he's just had the the best highlights tape of any player I've ever seen, and mm. the things he did. You know, like only little things, but I remember he, if he takes a normal mark, he's like three foot above everyone else. You know, like he just had that, he was extra two foot off the ground all the time than anyone could jump, you know. Mm. He was always, I remember running beside him at training and he's just like a powerhouse. He was mm. just like, you know, he's chinsley hitting himself in the mouth, you know, he just, he just had so much strength and power and, you know, he was a skillful champion player, he was. You wouldn't have known much about him when you got to Geelong. I mean, he played half a dozen games yeah, at Hawthorne. That's right. And uh, it would have been in his athletic prime then. He was probably, yeah. I think, 21 or 22. Yeah, he was. And he could do anything, couldn't he? Yeah, he could do anything. He was. He didn't train much either. Tommy handled him well. He just had that good rapport with him. Because mm. he was a bit different bloke, Gary, there's no doubt. Mm. But he's a nice guy. He's just a bit of a loner type of guy. But he, mm. he was didn't train too much. I remember he played... Oh, he came, I reckon it was 85 pre-season, we had a training camp at Anglesey and he hadn't been training before Christmas. You know, he'd been pink shooting or whatever he does, you know. <laughs> and he came down there and the first session, we did a 100 metre sprint, 200, he won both of those. He didn't go in the 400 or 800, because that was too hard for him. He, he kicked left foot 60 metres, right foot 65 metre drop punt. Like he, Tommy had this massive medicine ball, like real big thing and um, I remember Darren Flanagan threw it about a metre further than anyone, all the team, and then Gary threw it four metres further than him. <laughs> really? You know, he just picked it up and just, like, he just, just a powerhouse. Mm. I know they're different players, G. Ablett Senior and G. Ablett Junior. Yeah. But I think it's valid to compare them in terms of over their career. Mm. Highlights package, clearly Gary Senior. Yeah. But the young bloke is not far off him in terms of his output. Yeah, no, Gary Junior's a serious, serious player, like, mm. right up there and the best players best player in the league now, you know. and Is he best player in the league now? Oh, well, he's in there with Jada and those guys, you know, there's no doubt. He's a superstar and, you know, you got to hand it to him. You know, he had a, it's not easy for, for young blokes to have a father like he had and be in the limelight and to come through and to be good as a young junior, you know. Mm -hmm. I reckon it's a great effort, it really is. You played uh, just over 100 games at both Sydney and Carlton. Yeah. Uh, any difference between your output at either? Look, it's hard. You know, I played some really good footy at both clubs, you know, but, you know, I love the SCG as well. You know, I really love that, the Swans days there, and I love that ground. It just suited me down to the ground, and, um, you know, you're never far out of the action. You know, you could always make up some, some ground to get back in the play all the time, and that really suited me as well. Your mate from Sydney, uh, your teammate and mate, Jared yep. Healy, my mate on the couch, yep. he was a serious player, wasn't he? I mean, he, you were at your peak in Sydney, mm. uh, playing in the centre and alongside Jared and Jared won three best and fairests and you were runner up three times in a row. Yep. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jared was a star, there's no doubt. And we had a great rapport on the ground and he knew what I did and I knew what he did and uh, we had a great relationship, you know. They call us the Cracker Brothers sometimes, that's all. The Cracker Brothers. That's the sort of relationship we had on the field, I mean. Yeah. But um, no, it was great. Jared was a super player, there's no doubt. Skillful, kick goals run like just as well as anyone could run. I remember uh, being, when I was working at the AFL in the 80s, you came into my office and you were in a tears. You needed to find Kappa. The talk was that um, he was going to go to Brisbane. Mm. And I had this feeling that you thought things were falling apart in Sydney mm. and you needed to get Kappa and try to talk him into staying. Yeah, it was. I don't think it was a good move for Warwick going there. It was a terrible move. He was that sort of guy that 
fitted well with us in our team, but a new team, you know, Warwick didn't suit and it proved right as well. When you left Sydney, did you think that the club was going to go down? I don't mean down the ladder, I mean just go down and out. Look, I think the... I wanted to come back to Melbourne when I did, to Carlton, and you know, I was lucky enough that I got back to Carlton. But um, the AFL had given up on us up there. I felt, I really did feel it, and it was true. They just gave up on the club, and there was no direction whatsoever. And it got to the stage I didn't really want to spend the next five or six years just up there on our own again. Like, it was just, there was no direction, no... The club was in serious trouble. So did you think that they, it was just too, too difficult? from the people down here just sort of said, look, it's just a problem we're never going to solve. Let's just let it... Well, that's what it felt like to us up there. Yeah. It felt like it to me. You know, we're just getting no feedback of what they're going to do to help us. And, yeah, and I just decided to leave. And that was one of the main reasons. It wasn't If they had supported us and, you know, maybe give us... Like, I remember trying to get the Swans to get the New South Wales zone for a start. I tried with Ricky Quaid, you know, just to try to get some sort of... The zone that we mm-hmm. can, you know, to get some players. But the AFL weren't interested and yeah, it just felt like they didn't care and I left. Where was the interest from, who, who sparked the interest from Carlton? Oh, well, Peter Jess was my manager then. Mm-hmm. And, and this was a pretty, probably three months out from the year, you know. That's how bad we were going. I think we finished last that year. We were just in rock bottom and, um, yeah, Jesse said Colo was very keen to get us back and we did a deal. But it was hard to get back, it really was. The AFL didn't want me to go, of course. I had to go to court. I got They de- rubbed you out, didn't they? Yeah, I got deregistered for six weeks by the AFL, which was great. Got fined 25 grand. But that was over That was over contracts that didn't match up, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, but it was just a whack over the knuckles, I reckon. Was it? Yeah. Because you, because you, you were abandoning the ship? Yeah, they didn't want me to go, and mm. technically they were probably right. Mm. <laughs> but what, there were two contracts? Yeah, but... Everyone had two contracts, you know. Did they? Yeah, a lot of people did. A lot or everyone? No, a lot. Yeah. Well, that's nearly everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, you love playing in the middle. I know I mean, that's, you saw that as your domain. How did you feel that, uh, in 1995 when the edict came that you were going to go to a forward pocket? Well, I didn't feel very good about it. I didn't. But it just worked out like that. Parkin talks a lot, but he didn't talk much about that. Didn't he? No. To you? No, he didn't. No. He might say he did, but he, I can't remember it. And, um, yeah, it just worked out that I was going to play forward and ended up playing up there. So when did you learn that? Match day or during the week or when? Oh, look, I can't really remember exactly, Mick. I can't. But it worked out that I went up there more and I liked it up there, so I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kicked five goals in that premiership win. But yeah, early on, it didn't look like that you were going to be uh, making the most of the chances. No, that's true. No, I didn't go out there looking at kicking goals either. I just went out there with the same plan I always had, which was uh, to play in the centre. And but I did move forward, and but I struggled early. People get the perception that um, you know AFL players don't get nervous, or they just look like they're calm and cool and collected. But I remember that, like I said, the first kick to I got a kick about 55 out and had a shot for goal on the left foot and kicked it out of bounds and then ran out of bounds just near the point post. Mm. You know, it was a shocking kick. Because I was just that nervous, you know. I was just, mm. and I remember saying to myself, "Just pull yourself together, you know, like get it going." So after that, I was fine. After that, were they normal fine. nerves, or were you frustrated no, because was, you were you'd been pushed out? No, of... no, it was nothing to do with going forward. No, it was just the actual nerves of the day and the the big occasion. It was fact or fiction? The runner comes out to you in a, in a final at Waverley and says, "Diesel, go to half forward. Fraser Brown's going in the middle," and you said. I play in the centre here. <laughs> Look, I, I can't honestly remember. You're fibbing, Diesel. I can't honestly remember that. I can't. And that's not uh, to say it didn't happen. But um, You think it may have? I know the runner went out to Bruce Dool one day. <laughs> and Bruce said the runner doesn't come out to me. <laughs> that's a true story. Uh, versus Geelong in a final, which uh, we were being flogged in, having Geelong lost their best four probably midfielders uh, pre-game. And halfway through the third quarter, it was looking very ordinary. So I sent the message out to Greg, go forward and kick us a goal. 
which he was capable of doing, and in fact did. Immediately, of course, put himself back in the middle where Fraser Brown thought he was playing and should have been playing. And, a, and a, quite a vigorous argument started between the two of them. Siren rang, I'm out at three-quarter time, breaking up a uh, physical episode between the two players uh, on the basis that Fraser Brown thought he should be in the middle and so did Greg Williams. Probably one of the worst moments in my coaching career. When we return, Williams talks about that day he failed to poll a Brownlow vote and names the player he believes could win four or even more Brownlows. Straight up the centre, Williams! Well, he had his back to that ball, but you kick a goal here, Greg. Sure, no, he's a good player, hits Gleeson on the chest. Don't take this the wrong way, but the way you played your foot, and you're talking about the 40 possessions per game and mm. doing the things on your terms, playing where you want to play, yeah. were you selfish? I think I was... Um, committed and I went about a different way I was focused you know but whether you call that selfish or not like I did go out there to get 40 well you could probably say that's greedy but that's the standard I set um, I don't know what else to say I think I, I actually went out there I didn't go around telling everybody this either this is mm. you know I haven't told many people that I that was my game plan I just went out there I went out there every game to be best on ground. Mm -hmm. Like that was my mentality that um, I wanted to make sure on Monday that I was in the I was the best on the ground. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to do every Monday to read that. That was like the the commitment I had to it, and um, and I was pissed off if I wasn't, you know. <laughs> and I just build myself up for the next week if I wasn't, and try and get back into the best play on the ground again. That was the that's what I did for 14 years. Did you ever get stitched? You know, look, just had a, a had a shocker. The bloke on you played well. You couldn't find it. Uh, it just didn't work. Did you ever have a really bad day? Yeah, I think you said about the Buck and Arrow day. That was probably one of those days. You know, it was shocking. And uh, they were on fire, the Hawks, and the whole team struggled. But you know, it's just really disappointing when those sort of days. No, but they've happened, but uh, not that often, which was good. <laughs> <laughs> Any on-field incidents that you regret? Oh, There's been lots of them, I know, but are there any that you sort of that, that sit uncomfortably with you now? Yeah, I'd like to take them all out. No, you wouldn't. No, look, most of them. Really? Yeah, no, I would. I, I think would. you thought that you were justified in saying the Tony Shaw case and, and the yeah, Denham case. I think you I honestly that. believe they were retaliations. Mm -hmm. I really do. Mm -hmm. And even Reese's one was a retaliation. You know, like I think that's the way it was then, and I, I got them back. You know, but they shouldn't hit me first. <laughs> so, and I'm not, I'm not saying they're all retaliated either some I'm sure there's a few of them that weren't justified either but that's the way it was then it wasn't as you know it's not our it's not nowadays where it's there's hardly any punches thrown there it was punches thrown those days and um, you just have to protect yourself and try and get through you know I really come through a whole career of a lot of players trying to get me from off the square every centre bounce I had players trying to line me up I had a tagger on me you know like it's not an easy situation for for a star player, which I was mm. at that stage, mm. like, you know, you might think that's arrogant or selfish or I don't know, but that's the way it was, you know, and I had to put up with it every week and, you know, sometimes I got frustrated and retaliated. I know there's one incident that you regret. There was a photo in the uh, Herald, I think, at the time, of you chesting a bloke called Tony Lockett. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we actually saw a few photos earlier on the highlight tape and I said that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that's a definite mistake going anywhere near Plugger. Now, the black spot clearly was the incident involving umpire Andrew Coates, wasn't yeah. it? You got nine weeks nine weeks for that? Yeah, I did. How does that sit with you? No, I wasn't very happy with the nine weeks, I can tell you. No. I didn't think it was justified. It wasn't a deliberate action. It was like, oh, I reckon I was crucified for, you know, blokes now run over umpires and push them over. And, well, not quite, do well, they? Well, they run into them. Yeah, but they don't run over them and push them over. No, but they run into them and they they knock them harder than I touch them. So you know? can you take us through that? I mean, you, you appeared to be looking somewhere else mm. and your hand touched. Uh, yeah, well, that was a denim, denim thing again. Was it? Yeah. No, Sean, I think that day wouldn't shake my hand after the game. And I was a bit pissed off with him. <laughs> and I was focused on him and the umpire sort of come across my space, really. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just pushed him out of my space, that's all. Well, it wasn't an aggressive action or 
You knew it was the umpire, though. No, I don't reckon I did. You got the best vision of any bloke I've ever seen. You didn't know that it was the umpire yeah. in your face. No, you're correct. I had. I did have the best vision. <laughs> but, uh, no, I didn't see him. You didn't see him. And there was an eye expert at the tribunal who said that you can be focused on someone yeah. and not see someone in your vision. Like, I remember the time, and I was pretty harsh on you in print at the time, and I, yeah, wouldn't, have been, I wouldn't have been so harsh now, mm. but you were bitterly disappointed with the decision and I think the reaction of lots of people in the media too, weren't you? Yeah, I got railroaded, I reckon. I you got a, what? Railroaded. I just got made a big... You know, they made a point of making sure it doesn't happen again, which, fair enough, but... Also, the guy who cost me that time was um, Neil Busy. He was, he was away on holidays. Yeah. And um, they brought in some... I know the guy's name, I don't have to name him, but... Well, it was Shane Maguire. Yeah, yeah. and I reckon he had a shocker. You know, he first time on the tribunal and he... I reckon he got it wrong. Because he, he wanted to be seen to have actually sort of... Yeah, what, make a statement. And yeah. I just think it was a wrong... It was far too long. You know, mm. Say whatever you like. What, what should... Given the same circumstances again, yep. what do you think the, pe the appropriate penalty would be? Well, now it's a $900 fine. Uh, um, is yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, we'll so if, if you put your hand if you put your hand on an umpire now... Well, it was, so wasn't a hand... Like, like I said, I just brushed him aside. It wasn't a, mm. you know get out of the road or anything like that. It was yeah. just a... Yep. No, look, I'm, I just think that the suspension was too long. You know, it's unfortunate. Um, we actually went to court and got it stopped, if you remember, and then... Uh, or injunction, whatever you call it, and then at the end, it got back on again. So I ended up with nine weeks for the umpires mm. thing. But the irony is the umpires really liked you, didn't they? Well, they loved the way you played your footy. Only 12 blokes in history have polled more Brownlow votes than you. Mm. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Mm. I didn't know that. But no, I always, in my Bendigo days when I was 17, 18, I won two medals up there, umpire, you know, league medals. So, mm -hmm. no, I'd always poll well with the umpires. I actually polled better as the more umpires come in. When there was one umpire, and then there was two, and then there was three, mm. I actually polled better when there was three. Should you have won three medals? Look, I think I should have, yeah. I really do. That was, so the Gavin Wanganeen was the one you were beaten by a vote by Gavin Wanganeen mm. um, in 1993. Yeah. That you should have won the medal that year? Well, it's not so much I should have. I think there's a heap of players that haven't won one. You know, I'm lucky enough to win two and I'm very, like, I'm very happy with two. Mike. I'm not trying to say that I, you know, threes are the be all and end all, but it was the way I lost it. The, that disappointed me. That was all. Tell us. Well, the main reason about it was the the day I'd had, where I'd had 44 possessions and kicked a couple of goals, and I got best in every paper. I was the best on ground by every journalist in Australia, and I didn't get a vote that day. Now, mm. why didn't I get a vote that day? Well, you could say I was unlucky, or the umpire didn't like me, or and I could tell you that day I never swore an umpire or gave an umpire a, an issue because it's not easy when you're getting 44 positions Mike to be talking to anyone <laughs> you're flat out so I was really focused on that game and I played well you know I reckon I deserved to get a vote and I got none was so, there bad blood between you and John Russo yeah no there definitely was no there was but I reckon they were pre-games though the years before I'd always like he never gave me a free kick in his life he might argue <laughs> that but he never did he didn't like me and I didn't like him that was just <laughs> and he got me back, and that's where he got me back. So you're going to deliberately decided to vote, to not give you a vote that day because he didn't like it? Well, about six years ago at the Brownlow, the umpire came up to me and said, look, Greg, I want to talk to you for a minute. I said, OK. Anyway, it was the other umpire that day, and his name was a guy, Bird. Yeah, that's right, Murray Bird. Murray Bird. Yeah. He came up to me, and I, this is a fact, right? He said to me, look, I just want to apologise for that day. And I said, oh, yeah. What happened? And he said that, look, I'm not exactly sure of the word, I can't remember by him. Anyway, it was when, the gist of it was um, they went down, they sat down after the game, the two umpires, Russo and Murray, and um, Russo asked him, because Russo was a lot senior, a lot more senior umpire, mm -hmm. he'd lost, like he might have been 200 games at that stage, where I think Murray was about the fifth game he'd, he'd umpired. So Russo asked Murray, who do you think was best? Because you know, they're doing the one, two and three, and he said, oh, Greg Williams was best, no problem. Easily best on ground. And then Russo said, no. Nah. And he put, I know, I actually know, he put Mill Hanna down, right? He had, Mill had 19 possessions. And 
Russo asked Murray again, who do you think was best, or second best? And he said, obviously, you know, Greg, I think Greg was best, he deserves two votes. And he said, no. Nah. And he put Steve Silvani. And so I said 12 positions. Um, and then he's, this is true. I, he didn't, I didn't tell him, obviously, Soss had 12. I found that yeah. I've done the, my homework on it. And um, he said, well, who do you think for one? Because I only needed one vote to, mm. to draw the yep. Brownlow, you know. Anyway, um, Justin Madden, one vote. No, he said, no, I'm not voting for Greg. I'm putting Justin Madden down. And Bird, like, didn't argue as much as he probably should have. And because the umpires are supposed to do it together. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be Russo. Mm. It's not the Russo medal. It's uh, the umpires. I'm glad you've moved on, Diesel. Yeah. No, look, I mean, you asked me what happened, I'm yeah. telling you. Yeah. No, so, I appreciate it. Yeah, good. So that's, he apologised for he didn't stick up for me and he didn't, mm. didn't give me a vote. Did so, you, do you know what the Carlton voting was for that game? No, I don't. No, Peter no. Dean got three that day. From who? From in, in the Carlton Award, in the medal of Carlton. What, the best and fairest? Yeah. Yeah, I thought, I thought it was um, Mill. Got Brownlow votes. Check that one out. Yeah, no, I, but I'm just saying, I think Harry got one vote and he, mm. had, he had eight possessions. I had 44 and kicked two goals. You could say whatever you like. Yep. But there's pretty substantial evidence there. Hey, I'm on your side, mate. Yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah. I just reckon it was unfair. Yeah. But now, we, you were, from memory, you mm. were very angry at the, at the Brownlow medal count that year. Is that, is that no, fair? No, I reckon that's no, look, I was disappointed that I didn't get a vote in that game. Mm. Like, there's no doubt. But I didn't go around telling everyone else I was pissed off or anything. <laughs> I didn't. Um, how many weeks did you get for whacking David Reese jones Oh, I got five weeks. Five. Plus suspended, three suspended. <laughs> <laughs> that was crazy that night. I remember that was an STG game, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And tell me if I'm wrong here, correct me if I'm wrong, Reese whacked you and, and broke... A bone or, or, or the, the back of your shoulder? Yeah, you did. Okay, pick up the story from there. Well, I was wrestling. There was a bit of an all-in on the ground. And I was wrestling with Craig Bradley, actually. And we're on the ground. And actually, I got kneed from behind. And it was Reese. And he actually broke my shoulder blade, which, you know, it's not easy to break. But he did. He kneed me in the back on the ground from behind. And about a minute later, there was a ball up in the centre. And... Unlucky for Reese, he grabbed the ball and in you know, a ball up and I belled him back. Broke his jaw. Yeah, I did. Hmm. So it's just eye for an eye? But I, I just think it is. Yeah. Look, I'm I'm sorry, but I did. Was that your best shot, do you reckon? Of oh, I don't want to say it's my best shot. There's no point saying that, but it did break it. And now, it someone enough. badly advised Reese after that, didn't they? Instead of going off with his jaw swinging in the breeze at the SCG. No, I did it. It's a fact he went, I went down the goal square and actually he came down and followed me down there, which was a bad move again. <laughs> it was a bad move. But like, did you hit him again? No, I, he came at me again in the goal square, he did. And I, I did, I hit him in the jaw again. You know, I just, I did. And he went down again, because he's in a lot of pain, of mm. course. He was in a lot of pain. And oddly enough, you end up going to Carlton yeah, I did. and playing with, with Reese. Mm. Did, did that relationship, was that ever healthy again? Oh, I wasn't good. No, it wasn't. Like, Reese was really upset with it, and that's fair enough. But I, don't, I think I had a reason to hit him back, and I did. And, but it's a bit better now. I, I just think I see Reese now, and then I talk to him, and it's okay, you know? I remember you going to Carlton, I think, in 2009. I, think, I, I remember at the time thinking what a smart move it was to get you to come and do some coaching. Murphy was emerging. Juddy was there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, I think we can see some of your imprimatur on Murphy. Um, what about Juddy? Was there any part of Juddy's game that needed any attention? Yeah, I think... Like, when I take young blokes that... Even well, Juddy's a young bloke too, but he's a pretty senior player. But I take them for one-on-one. -on -one. Ball handling is my domain, really. I really have a lot... To, I take it seriously, my ball handling and skills and... I just try and pass on to the players what I did. Now, I show them, I had a really good technique when I played. I could, I hardly ever fumbled. I just had a really good technique where you could attack the ball as fast as you could, if, as you could, and it was a fantastic technique. It works for everybody. And I just try and show the players that. And sometimes I come across, you know, like young Murphy or Juddy or, you know, we've got slight problems with their technique and I show them what I think they should do. 
What would you say to Juddy when he put one down? <laughs> I just said he's not as good as ball in as he thinks he is, that's all. <laughs> no, I just think Can you say that to a dual yeah, no, I think he can and I think that's the good thing about him as well. He's got fantastic he's a fantastic ball handle. There's no and he's a superstar player as well. I'm not trying to but I think the stars also need help, mm. you know. I really I really believe that. And you know, I've spoken to Juddy about a few things between him and me and I think they're starting to come through. You know, they really are. Like? No, I just his focus, like he's so Oh, I don't know how to say it. Like he's so unselfish, you know. Mm. Like which I'm the opposite probably. I'm you know I said, I remember saying to him three, or three years ago when he got to Carlton that, you know, he can do a lot of things that no other players can do, you know, which is to win another Brownlow and then maybe win another one and mm-hmm. another one, you know, and I, it's a lot to put on a bloke and I probably shouldn't be saying it in public either, but he's the type of player that can, well, he's won two already and um, I think there's a serious chance that he could win three and, but they, if he says that doesn't mean anything to him, well, that's fine, but I think and I try to explain to him that, you know, he can set the standard again and be the best player of all time, you know. So I want to ask you about that, where he sits. I mean, you played with Kernahan and Bradley and yeah. Silvani and some great names at Carlton. We have. Where does, where does Judd sit in that group? Oh, he's right up there. There's no question. But I think as he continues on with his career, like he's probably got five or six years to go and he, who knows what he can, he can end up with in regards to hopefully premierships and... Um, Brownlow's best and fairest is on a, on track to be, um, you know, the best player of his time, no doubt. He's, he's an amazing athlete. Like, you talk about speed. I don't think I've ever seen a bloke who can pick the ball up as fast as him hmm. and running as fast. And I don't know how he does. He must just have so much. He just bends over and scoops it up like no one else. Where's the diesel come from? Who christened your diesel? Oh, that was a Geelong. Um, Mick Turner actually did that. He, Mick was a really good captain and um, you know, I had a lot of respect for him as soon as I got there. He was really, he had team meetings in those days, you know, well before his time and he actually had a motivational tape as well, mm. which was um, a gridiron tape was John Riggins, I'm not sure if you've heard of him. No. But he was a great running back in America at that time yeah, and he still holds the world record for yardage and his name was Diesel and for some reason. Okay. That was where it came from. Everyone thought I was slow and reliable, <laughs> like diesel engine or something, but yeah. it's not. It's not the case. Now we talked before about Brownlows. In your yeah. first Brownlow, there might have been an element of luck attached to that diesel. There was. Last game against Fitzroy, yep. you smacked Scotty Clayton in the comic cuts. Is that I right? I did. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I was very concerned at that stage. <laughs> yeah. No, I thought I would have got rubbed out. But um, Scotty yeah. did the right thing, or what we yeah, what was did. perceived to be the no, right Scotty thing. Scotty was time. good to play on. He was. Yeah. Yeah, he was a tough competitor and you know, we played on each other a fair bit. Mm. But he did the right thing at the tribunal. And, and lied. Probably did, yeah. Mm. But I always, um, when I played, I always hit my taggers in the chest here. Yeah. You know, like I'd always just bell them in the chest, you know, yeah. try and... <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't hit bust their diaphragm. <laughs> I did it all the time and it was a bit like that with Scotty, but I just went a bit low. <laughs> <laughs> Got him in the guts. <laughs> and he fell in the heap. <laughs> he did. Yeah. He did have a, a, a very uh, a strong penchant to, uh, to, to uh, throw this little short uh, left or right jab. I think he could do it with either hand. And uh, he got me in the, in the stomach and uh, I folded up like a, tar- a card table uh, from memory. And he did get reported. Uh, and uh, we went to the tribunal. And in those days, I think we were less than honest. Um, it was sort of uh, taboo to put anyone in, so I think uh, I think I, I, I helped him out there, and he ended up winning the Brownlow medal. You went on after football and went into a printing business and did very well out of it, so well that you don't have to work from your mid forties. Is the story true that you sat next to a woman on a plane and accommodated her with an autograph and and, and chatted to her, and she then said to you, "Look, uh, why don't you um, you're a printer? Why don't you mm. put a tender in for this printing job?" Yeah, it's true. That is true, is yeah, it? Yeah, it was actually, it wasn't on a plane, but it was a lady asked me to, to do a birthday card for her mother. And um, she was the person in the office at Kmart. I did the signature and everything. She said, well, why don't you come in on Monday and have a chat about the printing and that. So, yeah, no, it was a good story. I ended up with a Kmart account and... Um, it was worth millions, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And they really, <laughs> we did a good price though, Mick. It was no <laughs> funny business or anything. Oh, no, they wouldn't have been. <laughs> Is there any one thing in your footy career that you'd like a second crack at? 
the biggest disappointing thing for me was when I went to the car and I was injured. You know, mm. when, uh, was it 90, 92 or 91 pre-season, like I had a real bad knee then, my right knee, which is still, it's bugging now, but I was really in a pretty bad way at that stage when I just got back to Carlton. And I, if I had stayed as fit as I could have then and trained as well as I'd had um, at Sydney and been able to train properly, I reckon I would have been a lot better even at Carlton. So you had a three-year contract at Carlton? When you came four. in? Four, was it? Yeah, four years. And it was for big money then. Mm. You know, it was. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, I do. But I don't really want to say, but it was a lot. H- half a million? Not quite. Okay. Mm. Hey, Diesel, I love talking footy with you. It's been great to see you. It's a fantastic career, and we've enjoyed reminiscing about it. Thanks, Mike. No Thanks, Diesel. Good on you. This has been a Fox Sports production.